together this morning. Um, it's great to be able to gather as a church family. It's good to be able to see your faces and for you to be able to sit together and all of those things that we weren't able to do previously that we're able to do now. It's, it's great to be able to do that. I have a couple of announcements. Um, we're having an apple pie gathering on Saturday the 1st of October. So really, it's another reason for us to get together. That's really what it is. Um, but the people who prepare these things need to know that you're coming. So you need to sign up in Mosaic at the end of the service. That doesn't mean if you don't sign up, you can't come, but it would be really helpful to have some idea. And I was meant to announce this last week, so it would be great if you all signed up this week and wrote your names down um, so we have an idea of numbers um, for Saturday, the 1st of October, from half past two to four in the McKinley Hall. It's really just an opportunity after so long of being apart to get together. Um, hopefully I'll remind you at the end of the service, but you just sign your name and that would be, that would be super. Um, elders who get a hard copy of minutes are asked to collect them from the minister's room. Midweek recommences um, on this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. There's a slight time change there in the Bernie room, um, so pay attention to that. And life groups are beginning. You'll see this on the announcements. Um, Choir Plus is recommencing. Choir Plus. Um, On Thursday, the 29th of September at half past two, Really, for an opportunity, if you enjoy singing, this is the place for you on Thursday. Um, Really, from about half past two to about uh, 20 to four, psalms, paraphrases, and hymns for three quarters of an hour, followed by tea, coffee, biscuits, doxology, and home. Maybe George didn't mean mean to read the whole thing out to you, but that's what happens. That's just to let you know that it's prompt and you're here for a certain length of time. This evening, we have the Song Cafe at half past six, an opportunity to gather and worship more. Really an opportunity for praise, and we'll hear um, about, uh, we'll hear from Johnny Mullen and from Rebecca this Sunday evening, so we'd love you to come and be part of that as we gather. And the final announcement is the United Appeal envelopes will be in the pews for the next two Sundays, and it would be great for you to just think about that beforehand and be able to support really so much of the work that the Presbyterian Church does. So each congregation gives towards that, and as a cumulative total, then we're able to support things that we couldn't do on our own. Um, so I encourage you to give towards that over the next two weeks. As we come into worship this morning, I was fixing my hair this morning. Obviously, that's a huge project before I come to church. But I was fixing my hair this morning, and I was looking in the mirror, and I realized I hadn't shaved one side of my face. I was all distracted. And I had a whole moment where I thought, oh, goodness, what will people say if I don't shave my face? And in that moment, I had a whole thing just hit me like a sledgehammer where I went, oh, my goodness, this is not the most important thing that's happened today, is whether the minister shaved his face or not. And yet, when you're coming to church, you're getting ready for church, you're getting your clothes on, you're getting sorted. And we come to church with all sorts of things in our heads and in our hearts about what matters and what doesn't matter. And then we come here. We come here to remind ourselves that God loves us, that God sent Jesus in his wisdom and kindness and grace to live, to teach God's kingdom and his ways, to die for us, be resurrected and be ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit comes and indwells on those who believe and trust in Jesus. And I'm worried that I didn't shave my face. We come to remind ourselves this morning of the deep truth. You might have had something before you left the house. You might have odd socks on. You might have wondered about not having clean clothes as you were getting ready this morning. All sorts of things that are trivial and small. And yet we gather this morning with an awareness that God knows absolutely everything about us. God knows every thought you've had this week that God knows every action that you've done, every behavior that you've had. He knows far more than just the outer appearance that we concern ourselves with as we come. And God still loves us. And God still sent Jesus for us. And the Holy Spirit still resides and dwells in us whenever we trust in Jesus. That's what happens. And we are transformed from the inside out. And even those things that upset us and throw us off, and even the things you've done this week that you shouldn't have done, the things you've looked at or things that you've not done, kindness that you held back and didn't do, and God still loves us. And so this morning we gather for worship, which is one of the strongest things that we can do to remind ourselves of who God is, and because of who God is, who we are in turn. Psalm 51 declares, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your parents or from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Helen is leading us this morning. These words are over 400 years old. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is your health and salvation. 
old words, but words that the truth of continue to bless and to please our God. The truth of these words continue to minister to us as we still our souls, as we calm the franticness of our minds, and as we come and meet with the living God. Let's stand and worship him this morning. continue on with our kids praise and I see lots of boys and girls scattered about so if you would like to come up to the front because I like to hear you sing so just come on up lots of you down there and pop up onto the front pews and you can help us with our kids song God you're good to me
Let's pray together. Guys, you can stay where you are or you can go back. You're in. Let's pray. Father God, you truly are majestic. And through our praise, the psalmist tells us that that enables a stronghold. When we praise you, our lives become stronger. We're able to resist evil in our lives. We become closer to you as we declare what is true in the universe and is true in our hearts. We consider the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars. It is incredible that we can comprehend you and think of you. But even more than that, that you think of us. That you care for us and love us. That in your action in the world of generosity and kindness, you bless us with all that we have. Most of all, Father, you love us so much that you send your only Son. Jesus comes because of who you are. The God who loves us so much that you do everything necessary so that we can know rescue deep in our lives. The rescue that will set right the universe. All things will be put together and put back as they should be. Father, help us this morning in our worship and praise. Remind us of how majestic you are, but in turn, how loved we are and how we have the privilege to be able to live our lives in response to your love for us. Our heads are clouded with lots of things. Our hearts are clouded with lots of things. We get pulled in many different directions and we ask that you would help us to pay attention to you most of all today, that we may know clearly who you are and in turn who we are. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Boys and girls, you're free to go to glue. Nice, Isabel. Oh, Matthias. It's a long walk from upstairs. We should have a slide. <coughs> I would get people into the balcony if there's a slide to get out of it, goodness. <laughs> We're going to continue to worship God. Like the author of a book, God, the uncreated one, stands outside the laws of space and time, and he works out his plan as history unfolds. God has known the end from the beginning and in that we can find great comfort. This song that we're going to sing now, it's maybe a new one to some of you, um, so we're going to keep our seats. Um, if you know it, sing along with us or you can just sit and allow the words to bless you. It's a modern day hymn and you know we have fantastic modern day hymn writers. The Gettys, uh, Redman, we have Sovereign Grace Music, Aaron Keyes, Peter James, so many talented um, people who are writing what we call our modern day hymns. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the older hymns. We opened with one written in 1680 and we use those still. But how wonderful, how fresh, how inspiring it is to know that it's a well that doesn't run dry. That this is a gift that God has given from generation to generation so that we can, as David says in the psalm, sing and make music to our God. As you listen to this song, you'll hear um, lots of references to the Old Testament. The words are amazing. So verse 1 looks at God the creator, and then into verse 2, the power and the majesty of God. And verse 3, the incarnation, until finally in verse 4, Christ's victory over sin and death. And when we reflect on these glorious truths, how is it that we can keep from singing King of Kings forever?
David Johnson is going to come now and lead us in our prayers for others. In Matthew 18, 20, Jesus tells his disciples, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. Hebrews 4, 4 16 encourages us to approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and answer them in accordance with your will. We continue to remember the royal family as they mourn the passing of Queen Elizabeth. As a family, they have lost a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother. May they now have privacy to grieve their loss out of the public eye and the scrutiny of the media. Over the last number of weeks, many have spoken of and testified to the Queen's personal faith in Jesus Christ. May her faith life continue to point people to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the life and witness of Betty McDowell and Trevor Newman. We thank you for their faith and sacrificial service in our church here in Glen Gormley. May we be inspired and challenged to follow them as they followed Christ. Lord, your words hold up hope, out hope for the believer that this earthly life is not the end, that our citizenship is ultimately in heaven, and that our Saviour Jesus Christ will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. May these promises bring comfort and assurance to the families of Betty and Trevor, and also to the family of Queen Elizabeth. We lift up to you those in our congregation who are ill. May they know your peace, love, and hope. Help us as a church family to love well. Increase our love for one another. When our human desires falter, strengthen and motivate us by your Holy Spirit. As we partake in communion this morning, we remember our children and young people. May the seeds of faith be planted and watered in their lives so that one day they might be able to say with confidence that Jesus is their Lord and Saviour. We humbly ask for your blessing upon our community activities. May our apple pie gathering be a precious time of fellowship for all who attend. We also remember the Merce Bible reading program. May it be, may it be a significant time of spiritual nour nourishment and growth for our church family and beyond. We remember our community. We ask for your blessing upon all people living and working within Newton Abbey. Would you bless local businesses and protect jobs during these challenging times? Lord, help those who are anxious about money to be able to access the help that they need. Sovereign Lord, nations rise and fall, yet you remain constant. We pray for Liz Truss and the new government government in Westminster. We pray for a strong opposition to hold them accountable. Give them discernment and compassion. Help them to make wise decisions that will benefit all in society, not just the wealthy. We pray for the protection of the most vulnerable in society. We pray for our local politicians. Help them to find a way through this current political impasse. Help them to set aside their political differences and strive for the good of all in Northern Ireland. Father, as we think of the wider world around us, our hearts are heavy. There is so much cause for 
us concern as we look at the issues caused by mankind's greed and self-centeredness. We are so limited in our human understanding and we cry out to you with a childlike faith, trusting that you are sovereign in these situations. We continue to pray for the country of Ukraine. We pray against an escalation of the conflict. Father, we pray for the protection of those Russians who have been brave enough to publicly object to the war. May the voices of dissent grow stronger. Bless the peacemakers, those working behind the scenes trying to bring about a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Strengthen the believers in Ukraine. May they know the encouragement and power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, even in the midst of this terrible situation, would a window of opportunity be opened for the gospel to bear fruit in both Ukraine and Russia? Lord, we have seen the protests in Iran this week, and it again reminds us that so many women in the world do not have freedom, equality, and civil liberties. We also know that in Afghanistan, many girls and young women are not able to access education, things that we take for granted in this country. Father, we pray for justice and equality. As we watch our TVs and listen to our radios, the evidence of climate change is undeniable and the results are disastrous. Lord, we have damaged the beautiful creation which you entrusted to us. We have been negligent and irresponsible stewards. Lord, help nations, industry and individuals to set aside their own self-interests and work together for the good of the environment. We bring all these prayers before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. We are going to look at the last couple of verses that we didn't look at last week. So we're going to begin in Philippians 3 and, and reading verses 17 to 21 today. Just looking at one of these sections that I think um, bears witness, particularly in our part of the world. So Philippians 3, verse 17. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And this is our reading for today. The phrase that I want to pay attention to this morning is where Paul writes, our citizenship is in heaven. Citizenship is all about where you belong. Paul uses the word the word he uses for citizenship, poletuma, Paul is the start, is the, is the root word for this, which is city. It's where we get our word of politics. It's where we get our word police. That's the root that it goes back to. Paul is city. And whether you're Roman or Greek or Jewish, the city was at the center of this. In Philippians 3, it is, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me take a minute and locate this in Philippi first. And then we can look at what it looks like in our world today. In Philippi, which was a Macedonian Greek city, it was built 350 years before Jesus. It was built by Philip of Macedon, of Macedonia. It's nice to name a city after yourself. I think it has to be the ultimate sort of ego flex. So Philip built Philippi. It's good. I don't think, there's no cities of the world called Reuben or Rubens or Rubo. There's none of that. I don't have any cities named after me. But Philippi built the city and named it after himself, which just amuses me. It might not amuse you, but I think that's funny just to be able to do that. What happened is then the Greek Empire existed. And then as historians put this at all of the commentators, it became part of the Roman Empire, which sounds like a transaction that was nice and agreeable. Essentially, the Romans took over the Greeks. So what the history books tell you is it became part of the Roman Empire and then the Romans rebuilt it because when it became part of the Roman Empire, they leveled it um, in order to conquer it. So that's how so empires move. It was rebuilt by Emperor Octavian. It became a major part of the roads going east from Rome. And then because of that, that's how they traded, how Rome traded with the east. It became a military outpost 
it makes sense, you want to protect the, the transport and how things move. But what the Romans did, which was very clever, was they populated Philippi with, with veterans from their military campaigns. So your pension became some land at Philippi, and you got to live in Philippi, which is a way that they could really put a city that was far away from Rome under their control and ensure that it stayed under their control. Because the people who lived there were all ex-soldiers who had served Caesar, and this was part of their pension. It was part of how they got looked after by the state. As part of the system that Philippi was in, they had a thing called Ica Italium. I know about as much of that as you do now. But it meant that in Philippi, you were Roman citizens. So this gave them a little bit of kudos. My similarity would be Royal Hillsborough. And if you live in Hillsborough, you're a little bit chuffed because you live in a Royal Hillsborough because they've got the ad, the name Royal to the thing, and they have a little bit of... But if you lived in Philippi, you had the extra bit. If you lived there and that was home, you were a Roman citizen, even though you weren't in Rome. And you had the benefits of being a Roman citizen. And they were proud of that. They were proud to observe Roman customs and obey Roman laws. And they were proud to be Roman citizens. Philippi was inhabited by Greeks. Historically, if you'd been there for a long time, your family would have been Greek. Inhabited by the Romans and then some Jews. Paul's writing this letter. So let me remind you of Paul. Paul's born, born initially in... Well, born. He's not born initially. He's just born in Tarsus, which was in Turkey. He was a Greek Jew, and he's also a Roman citizen. So somehow he's Turkish, he's Greek, he's Jewish, and he's Roman. In our world, you get funding for that, so he would he'd fit all the boxes in some sort of claim system. But he has all of these identities wrestling within him. At the end of Acts, when he gets into trouble, he appeals directly to Caesar, and that's why he goes to Rome. Because as a Roman citizen, nobody can touch him. There's a series of things happen in Acts, and he gets imprisoned, and he's about to get beaten. And he goes, are you going to beat me? Because I'm a Roman citizen. And in, in Acts, it records that the captain is like, oh my goodness. And he's running to go, I, I've, all, I've done something I shouldn't. Because a very honest human aspect in Acts of like, we have imprisoned a Roman citizen, and that, that we, he's completely befuddled. But Paul ends up going to Rome because he's a Roman citizen, and he can appeal to Caesar. I think Paul's identity by human standards is complex. He lives in a Greek world that's been taken over by the Romans. He's Jewish. He's Greek. He's not Turkish because Turkey didn't exist. But his identity moves throughout the empires. While, as we looked a few weeks ago, he is more Jewish than the Jews. He has all of the titles and history and respect of that. And so you have identity in Philippi that he writes to that is complex and nuanced. You have identity in Paul himself that is multi-layered. And then you come to us. So in our part of the world, identity is complex. A few years ago when Brexit and the campaign was happening, the Sun newspaper, I won't quote the Sun often because I don't think it's very reliable, but I think you get a little bit of an insight here. They ran a campaign to change the colour of the British passport. You might remember this from a few years ago. And they had a Tory MP who said, the restoration of our own British passport is a clear statement to the world that Britain is back. Now, I think you may feel deeply impassioned about the colour of the British passport, but I hope you can see that the colour of the British passport will not be the thing that dictates how strong Britain is as a country, or if it is, goodness me, we're in trouble. If the colour of your passport dictates any sense of strength, you can buy a cover in the bookstore and make it any colour you want if you want to protect it. Who knew a colour could mean so much? And yet we live in a part of the world where colours are really important. You know where you are in the city based on the colours that you see in the walls or in the curbstones. The curbstones are going out of vogue a little bit, but at certain points in the year, the curbstones get painted and you know where you are. And you know whether you feel safe or you don't feel safe or you don't care and you move about. It all depends. This week, in the national life, we saw what will probably be for a long time the peak of Britishness. I don't know if you watched it Monday. I was glued to it to the point where at a certain point I went, I can't, I can't, I'm full now. I, I can't handle it anymore. But it was an incredible, incredible pomp and ceremony, incredible regimentation. Like the, the soldiers had practiced throughout the night so nobody could see what was happening, but they had to get it right. I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the mechanism of it all. I was completely geeking out. Spare thought for Glenda, who had to listen to me as I told her random facts that I'd learned from the BBC. But we probably all watched some of it at some point. Hundreds of world leaders. I was amused that the US president was in row 14. Probably the only room he's in in the world where he's not at the front. I was like, ah, oh, you're in a seat there. That's where you go. Because there's lots of other people here who are more important than you. And he took a seat. World leaders sat where they were told. 
military bands and guards. As one person commented, the peak symbol of Britishness was the 10-mile queue. Only the British would queue for 22 hours, orderly and in form. But you see through all of it, peak Britishness. This was the country coming together to mark the death of the Queen. You saw at the very end of the service that was the, the service in Windsor was a remarkable symbolism of her crown and orb and scepter being removed from the coffin. And if you saw that, it was incredible. And her, her head civil servant broke some wand or cane that he had and put it on top of the coffin. The ceremony of that, I got a little bit emotional at a couple of points. I didn't expect that. But I was like, there's something happening here. All of this has content and means something to people. 28 million people watched the funeral. And they think globally it was in the billions as people in other countries watched people here remember the death of the Queen and mark that. In the funeral service, there were two things that I thought were very interesting. One, the Archbishop of Canterbury, whose 502-word sermon was quite exceptional. I can't say much in 500 words. I'm sorry about that. If I was better, I would say it faster and quicker. Um, but in 500 words, he really laid out most world leaders in their search for power. He spoke of the Queen's faith. But what I want to address this morning is he said at one stage, her late majesty's example was not set through her position or her ambition, but through whom she followed. He was very clear who the Queen was. And the second thing that struck me in the service in the middle of everything else, which I enjoyed um, until the point where I was full, I couldn't handle any more of it, but I, I enjoyed watching it. It was interesting to watch how a country marks the death of a leader. But the second thing that I thought was interesting was a Scottish Presbyterian who simply prayed for our sister Elizabeth. I thought, there's the Presbyterian. He was there. He was respectful. But when all is said and done, what counts is not her circumstance, but who she was. And he took very seriously. I thought, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury said it at one other point in the service, but he was very clear. He didn't pray for the Queen. He prayed for his sister Elizabeth. He thought, that's the sense of, as a human being, this was her role. But ultimately and eternally, what matters is where she is with Jesus. But you saw today what citizenship, what identity looks like, or this week, what identity looks like in a British context. The other thing that we saw this week was the census results. Whether that was interesting to you or uninteresting to you, the headlines were clear. It was all about who is Catholic and who is Protestant. That was the key thing. It didn't matter how well the country was doing. It didn't matter about education. Those things will come out. But the key thing in the headlines and all the papers was really about Catholics and Protestants. That was the only indicator of how we are as a place. And just hold in your head Philippi, Paul. This is what we read this morning. And then there's where we live and what's important where we live. We live in a place where the idea of being a citizen is changing rapidly. 9% of people here were raised in a home with no religion. And in our census, they ask a different question because now 24% people, of people say they have no religion. And so the question in our census is, what religion was your background in? So you can't even get away from whatever you grew up with. Oh no, we're going to ask, what were your parents? What did they raise you as? Because this is what's most important in the place where we live, the idea of citizenship where we are. One in four people are saying publicly in the current form that they have none. I think you go further than that. Because you have to think how many of your friends and neighbors and family and extended family and work colleagues are in any place of worship today or this month. So we say this is our religion, and yet you have to go, how committed are you to this? That's part of the change in citizenship that we're seeing. But Paul, in his letter to the local church in Philippi, writes really clearly, and part of the challenge is it's so clear. If Jesus is Lord of your life, then you are a citizen of heaven. And if we take the Bible seriously, if we take Paul's words seriously at all, we need to apply this idea to our own lives first. When you're a citizen, you live like one. You follow the ways, customs, and norms of that place. So if you're British, you do British things. You follow the ways, norms, and customs of being British. You probably watched some of the Queen's funeral. The headlines on Tuesday were that some of West Belfast did not watch the Queen's funeral. I don't think anybody was shocked by that. There's no surprise there on Monday. But it was a headline in the usual brouhaha. But if you're British, you follow the ways, customs, and norms of being British. You might like cricket and rugby. You may have an affection for royalty. If you're Irish, you do Irish things. 
You follow the ways, customs, and norms of being Irish. You might watch GAA. You probably mark St. Patrick's Day. You might speak some of the language. If that's your citizenship and your culture, that's probably where you are. To move it out of the province, because that might be too thorny for some of you. When I lived in Dublin, I worked at, at a youth center where Americans came for a year at a time. And Americans... Customs and norms and ways. One, they were very entitled. It took them a long time to get used to doing things as we do them. They were like, can somebody not do that for me? So anyway, that was a different thing. That's me giving out about Americans. But they marked the 4th of July, which we didn't mark at all. We had no interest in marking the 4th of July, but they thought this was a really big deal. And they, did, they were surprised that other parts of the world didn't mark their holiday. And they also marked Thanksgiving, which was great if you're an American living in Ireland for the year when we were living in Dublin, because you get to go to Thanksgiving. You get an extra Christmas dinner in November, was what it translated as. Now, for them, it was about the beginning of a country. For us, it was just, you want, to, you want us to come to your house for turkey in November? Great, extra turkey, super. And pumpkin pie is a disaster. That shouldn't happen. But anyway, that's, that's the Americans. For, I have a friend who was very offended that I didn't like it. I think she's still offended that I didn't like it. But those are the customs and norms of being American. And being American abroad, these are the things that they held to and kept going. And, and there's little things. But it's the same everywhere in the world. If you're a citizen in a place, there's customs and norms and habits and rhythms that you have. In Philippi, it was the Roman way. For some, it was the Greek way. But overwhelmingly, the Romans had taken over, and that was the pattern and systems and norms. Christians came, and they operated in the customs and rhythms of following Jesus. Paul names here today that our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where our orientation is to be. Last week, we looked at very simple terms at the back to school service of what God's golden rules are, to love God and love your neighbour. It is re reducing it right down, but it is at the heart of being a citizen of heaven is that you love God and that you love your neighbor. And so last week, we talked about loving your neighbor. It's a really simple parable, the Good Samaritan. The problem in the Good Samaritan is it's so simple we understand it. So the question would be this week, I'm not asking for hands up or to move, but just to think, did you love your neighbor? Did you apply what we spoke about last Sunday? I did not. I have not done anything this week that was different to my previous week because I heard and reflected and I even spoke to you about loving my neighbor. Did you love your neighbor this week? Did you love your workmate, your physical neighbor, somebody you met this week, somebody around you? Did you apply what you believe in the world into the world that you live in? Or else we hear things on a Sunday and we don't put it into action. Paul names being a citizen of heaven. And when we're a citizen of heaven, if you reduce it right down, the evidence would be, do you love God with your life? And do you love your neighbor? I've seen people this week love their neighbor. I've seen people love people in incredible ways. I don't know if I was part of that. That's part of the conviction that we face at times is to reflect on what we're doing. Our citizenship is in heaven and we live in a part of the world that wants to reduce it to British, Irish, Northern Irish. But if I was in another country, I would say French, Italian. It doesn't matter. It's not about here. But we hold those things almost certainly in too big a way in our lives because Paul tells us that we're citizens of heaven and that's how we're to live. I worry in this part of the world that the church that I'm part of as a denomination has spent so much time on political stuff that it's missed the point. We live in a place that is full of people. There are people here. People that we're told as Christians and citizens of heaven that we're meant to love. And as part of loving God, we're meant to love our neighbor. The Presbyterian Church in North Belfast as a presbytery has accepted two communities for a really long time. A really long time. There are two sets of people here, and there's one set of people that are our people and another set of people that are not, and it automatically loses 50% of the people. It's not what Paul describes. It's not what Paul describes at all. You're a citizen of heaven. They are just people. Our wider church is comfortable doing mission to our Catholic and multinational neighbors below Neary, but really struggles above it. That's part of the challenge of being Presbyterian. We buy into where our citizenship is, and that steers how we function where we are. But we live in a place where publicly the stats are one in four have no faith. So 25% of the people have no faith at all. But I think if we're honest, most people don't have faith. They're not radically committed to Jesus. At which point, our lives, the opportunity that we have in Glengormley and in Newton Abbey to bring this right down from the denomination, which is just too easy 
to throw things at us. People have tried to be faithful over 50 years. But for us in this time and space is to go, there are thousands of people around us and they need Jesus. They need their citizenship to be in heaven because right now they're not serving either one of the camps or any of the cultural norms. They're just trying to get a job, to raise their families, to have some holidays. They're just trying to live lives, but they have no wider faith in God. Our citizenship is in heaven, and our role as a church is to encourage and help and support people as far as we can to be able to see Jesus as clearly as possible. That's our job. That's our role. Not to make them, it's not even to make them Presbyterians or Protestants. It's to enable them to see Jesus as clearly as possible, because ultimately they will be citizens of heaven if they trust Jesus. We should have our eyes on who we really are and who we want to be like, because it's the only thing that will last There's an old joke about the Presbyterians in heaven, and they get a room to themselves because they think they're the only ones there. It's too easy. And if you're a Baptist, I can make the joke about Baptists. You just do this. But ultimately, we get to be in the presence of God as citizens of heaven. And a lot of the things that we spend our time on will fade away and not last. And it's important for us as a church to be clear about that because the great news is that Jesus will come and by his power will bring everything under his control and transform us to be like him. And all we're really doing is becoming like the only things that will last. We await Jesus who will come and and bring everything under his control. And in that process, he will transform our bodies into glorious bodies. And the customs and norms and ways of God's kingdom, because God is the one who comes, begin to happen on earth. So the action isn't somewhere else as you read the Bible and you read Paul. Because Jesus comes from heaven. And ultimately at the end of time, as you read in Revelation, heaven comes to earth. This place is the place that is transformed and changed. The norms and the ways of heaven will one day be what happens on earth. When you say the Lord's Prayer, on earth as it is in heaven, that's what we pray for. We pray for God's kingdom and God's rule to begin to inhabit this place. We really begin that as a church. That's what we do. That's what our call is in the community that we're in, is to begin to enable heaven to break out on earth as a foretaste of what will ultimately happen and what we believe to be true. And so we love God and love those around us. From Paul in Tarsus to Paul in Philippi to the local church, to us today, we're called to be citizens of heaven because we trust Jesus in this life and the next. Let me pray for us. Father, we live in a place that has spent so long for centuries, debating citizenship and identity. And yet your word is really clear of who we are made to be in Jesus, which is citizens of heaven. Father, for some of us, this is deeply threatening. And yet it's how you've called us to be because the glimpse is that eternally, this is how we will be. And we get to live like that now. Father, we have friends and family and neighbors who are heavily invested in the citizenship of the here and now. Father, help us as a church to not buy into that, but enable others to see that there is a far greater identity to be found in Jesus. Jesus who came to where we are for us. Father, help us as we consider Glengormley and Newton Abbey that we would be people who reflected Jesus by going to where people are. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.
If for you, you trust that Jesus is Lord of your life, you are welcome to join with us. We practice an open table here. But the key thing is that you trust Jesus with your life, that he is Lord of your life. And if you do, you're more than welcome to join with us. But if that is not true for your life, just allow communion to happen around you and just be present within this and watch what people are doing and think about the words of what Christ has done and what Christ instructs us to do. We will all take the bread and wine at the same time so if you can just hold it until I prompt you, and we're still with the little cups, so I realize that's a, that's a technical thing. If you don't have any, and if you want to raise your hand, because you may have come in this morning and not got any, and I'm going to ask if an elder wants to look around and see some people with their hands up, if they could get some cups. Here, I've got one. I don't want to throw it. It'll, it seems a, a recipe for disaster. And so this is something that we do that is a serious thing, but it is a joyful thing. Because this is where we remember that Christ died for us. And Christ gives us the practical prompts that we would remember this. That this would shape our lives, the reality of the death and then the resurrection of Jesus. So we do this to be obedient, but we do this with a joy of, thank goodness Christ has done this. I have one. Does anybody else need any? There's a couple. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. And then just practically, there's, there's two pieces of cellophane at the top. I'm aware some people might not have done this before. I would encourage you, because it will take your head space out of communion, really, just the, the fidgetiness of this, to take the top piece off um, just so, so that you're ready. Um, I find it quite difficult. You might not, but I just... Uh, and then we'll just wait for a moment. We'll take this together, but I, I'll instruct you of that as we, as we move through this. And so we do this because we're obedient to Christ. That's why we worship. That's why we're here. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is why we do this as people who are obedient to Christ. Let's pray together. Father God, we give thanks to you for your everlasting love for us. Your love truly is wondrous. We don't fully comprehend that your love for us never gives up, never fails does not keep a record of wrongs. We thank you that we learn to love from you, the God who is love. You've brought us together as we gather to celebrate communion together in remembrance of what you've done in our lives, in the hope of the continued work that you do in our lives and for the life to come. Father, we are deeply unworthy to be in your presence, but because of your will for us, your desire to send your son Jesus to be the way, the truth, and the life. We can know you, be in relationship with you, and be in your presence. Father, by your Spirit's power, enable us to find our rest in you. In this confidence, we pray that in receiving these elements of bread and wine, that they would be for us the communion of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. And so according to the example and command of Jesus to remember, to proclaim, and to nourish us, we do this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We take and eat.
In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. May the Lord Jesus Christ, who was obedient to death, even death on a cross, guide, encourage, and protect you. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that we've been privileged to sit again at your table in this foretaste of what we have to come in the life ahead. Holy God, you have opened our ears to hear your word and our lips to declare your truth. Open our eyes today to see in the cross the revelation of your love through Jesus the crucified, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, be honor and praise. Father, we pray for those who are unable to be with us this morning. We pray that they would know your presence, even though they are not with us, but they would know that you are with them, that you are near. Father, we pray for those who are struggling today, those who physically or emotionally or really in any area of their lives are just struggling. Father, we pray that you would remind them of the deep truth that they are loved. But Father, give them eyes to see your prompting and leading in their lives because you're at work in all of our circumstances. And so we pray that we would be able to see and know that you are working. We pray that you would build up hope in our hearts and the faith in our heads. And Father, we pray for those this morning whose hearts are orientated in directions that aren't towards you. Father, we all struggle in different areas of our lives to be focused and attentive to you. But Father, we pray for those this morning for whom their appetites and desires, their intentions and lifestyles are in other ways. And Father, we pray by your grace that you would bring orientation, that you would bring that sense of focus and direction back towards you. That as your people, that we would live as citizens of heaven, loving you with all of who we are and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves as a testimony of where we are headed and who we are now in you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're going to finish our service with some more praise.
going to thank George and the band and Matthew and Shep, sorry Peter, Shep, that's not fair, uh, and those on Welcome and those on Glow um, for enabling worship to happen and those on Coffee which we're about to have so you don't need to rush off um, or tea or juice or whatever you like because some of you will say you don't like coffee. It's great to have time for fellowship at the end of the service. Let's say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you.